Welcome to Collector's Corner, the premier digital art platform. We help collectors gain and maintain their edge, all while appreciating beautiful art. Let's jump in. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Collector's Corner. We've been waiting. This has been a goal from the beginning to have the fantastic world building visionary. I'm sorry I said it wouldn't embarrass you, and I just started off the bat with that, but you are truly somebody that we've looked up to for a really long time for multiple reasons. We have here today with us Snowfro. We're calling this Creator's Corner because, and an artist corner, honestly, because we want to hear about you, the creator, and you, the artist. If we have time, we probably won't love to hear about you as the collector because we know you're a great collector as well. But thank you so much for being here, Snowfro. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good, guys. And thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Likewise. I mean, we're super excited. We know the time's going to fly by. My name is P. For those who don't know me, I'm joined by my co-host, Jared, who, as always, is dressed far better than me. How are you doing today, Jared? <laughs> I'm living the dream, as always. I put on my my lucky vest, and it won't show up on screen, but my lucky socks, too. So th- th- oh, I'm going sweet. all in on this one. Wait, tell me about your lucky socks. Is it a color, or are there donuts on them? Yeah, it's what? patterning. I actually, uh, you can't see it in the long sleeve, but I have a star tattoo. And uh, so I wear oh, socks with stars on them anytime I go into like a big interview, big presentation. So sweet. There you, you go. Do you watch them? Is it like the athlete thing where they don't wash oh, their God. lucky items? <laughs> I wash them after every time. And and I know uh, P went to USC, so I'll, I'll give a little bit of jab. They're, they're Cal Berkeley's color. So they're blue with yellow stars. There you go. There you go. Representing. Well, uh, yeah, so thanks so much. Just to, we were talking a little bit off screen. We want to talk about you, the artist, and then you, the creator. And we figured we would start with you, the artist. And we had the pleasure of interviewing your brother, Daniel, a few months ago, actually almost six months ago now. And he talked about how your grandfather was a great artist. And we just wanted to ask you, what what was uh, what role did art have in your life growing up? It's so interesting, especially coming from Daniel and after, uh, you know, well, I've essentially been following in my brother's footsteps when it comes to art. You know, like both my my grandfather obviously was an artist, and I very much appreciated his work. But like my day to day was being exposed to just like this ability that Daniel has to um, represent the the world around him. Um, you know, it it was actually like an intimidating factor in in my thought that I could ever become an artist or be an artist was just like realizing how incredibly deficient I was in communicating um on paper an intent compared to something like what what he would do and you know he could draw your face and recognizably in just a few minutes and just drew these beautiful landscapes and and then some really goofy stuff which is some of my favorite stuff that he's ever done so um you know I I very much feel that there's art an artistic intent in my family and my bloodline uh but uh to me the the full embodiment of that was uh you know my brother and watching him since he was very little just like fully embrace art and and seeing his success these days is is just cathartic it's really it's really exciting yeah and and so were you were you collecting art from those early days as well you know were you appreciating it uh beyond your brother's work so like what was your relationship to art early on actually didn't collect much uh art for the sake of art itself i collected comic cards comic books um i was i've always been a collector for sure um i had a uh continue to have like a a playing card collection so every time i'd go to a new city or country or museum or whatever i'd collect a deck of cards from there and i have a a pretty insane collection of, of playing cards i was always into um into like playing cards card games magic i was huge into magic as a kid you know sleight of hand and i i could do a lot more tricks when i was younger than i can do now uh i also really liked collecting lighters i've always been fascinated especially as a kid i was fascinated by fire um just like a lot of other kids and um so you know every every time i'd be in a new place i'd i'd buy a deck of cards and a lighter or one or the other depending on what was available um and i have a a pretty interesting collection of those as well It, it wasn't really until i got to um college that I well okay it's rewinding a little bit too when I was in high school I um really got deep into photography and in fact my my thesis for graduating high school which you know I, I went to a, a school with an international baccalaureate uh program and so like the thesis I wrote there was way harder and more thorough than anything I did in college 
Um, and so like to me, it, of any theses that I've ever written, that was probably the hardest one. And I wrote mine on, on a photographer named Diane Arvis, uh, which is a, a black and white photographer. Uh, and um, I was just, I, I was a huge fan of photography to the point where I ended up with a small and larger in my closet, in my bedroom at home. I mean, tiny, literally just kind of like moving around and, um, uh, that materialized as a digital photography kind of like curiosity in college. I was always the nerd with the camera asking everybody to get together to take pictures, but um, did very little from an artistic pers perspective. But I, I, at that point started realizing like the, the beauty of collecting photography as well. And then it wasn't until I got out of college and had a little bit of disposable income where I, I really did kind of start leaning into it. And uh, one of my very first collected artworks is actually a really close friend of mine, Peter Mollick. He goes by Pixel Pete within our ecosystem. Uh, he's a photographer, and uh, he uh, was the first time that I had seen a photograph that I wanted to spend like a decent amount of money on. And you know, I think he was very modest with his pricing, very humble with his pricing. And uh, so I'd say maybe the third or fourth artwork I reflected was was a, was a formal Peter Mollick photograph. Um, Beyond that, I I did collect and continue to collect as much as possible well, a local Houston artist. His name is Carlos Pozo. He's a screen printer. And I think that has a lot of it. It's, it's had a very big impact in kind of my understanding of like the art world today in that uh, the ability to make a, a purchasing decision on buying a piece of art for $35 is very different, obviously, than a thousand or a hundred thousand dollars. And the amount of joy you can get out of a $35 piece of art is comparable to the amount of joy you can get from a $2,000 or $10,000 piece of art. Uh, and, you know, um, that mixed with like this like inherent hoarding slash collecting mentality got me to a point where anytime he released a new artwork, you know, he was, he was nice enough to reserve his, like, so they would be additions, one of five or one of 10. And he'd always reserve the number one for me as like someone that was a big, you know, supporter um, uh, of his work. And I have a, a pretty thorough collection. And, and I just look back on those days of being able to collect $35 artwork and really feel like I was collecting art and supporting an artist. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, things change when I started to have a little bit more disposable income and can collect uh, from artworks outside of the the local art scene, but yeah, did that been... influence the price of uh, Squiggle? Because the original mint price was 0. 0.035. Correct. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, partly the fact that like I was not an established artist, and I feel like you know you got to start somewhere, and also partly the edition size, and also partly yeah, making it as accessible as possible. Like a twenty dollar purchasing decision is not. I mean, it's not 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 just anybody can make it. That's naive to say it's like for anybody, but a, a, a much larger group of, of of humans can just participate in a $25, $20 thing. And it was really important to me to put something out there that demonstrated a where I was in my artistic career, even though I had spent many years tinkering with art, creating art. I, you know, even when I released the Chromie Squiggle, it had already been um, you know, two artworks that I had sold for like three or four thousand dollars a piece, big sculptural pieces. So I had established some kind of like value in in the things that I created, but um, yeah, the idea of the squiggle and the idea of things that I want to work on moving forward is is being able to release something that's available and accessible to a larger audience. It's something that P and I absolutely adore, and we look forward to every year is the pilgrimage to to Marfa. Can you comment or and shed some light on to everybody else about like what Marfa means to you, and then especially I became very enamored with the influence of. Donald Judd on you as an artist and seeing that come out in a hundred spaces and being able to, to share that with the world. Like what does, what influence has Marfa and, and Donald had on you? A lot. Uh, well, first of all, I stumbled into Marfa uh, right after my first kid was born, right before my wife was going back from maternity leave. And we decided to do a trip that kind of took um, west texas into account so we went to like big bend national park and kind of drove through marfa on the way there she's an architect and you know it is a mecca for like art and architecture i was curious but i definitely wasn't as excited as she was to go visit marfa and it was it literally like the moment we drove into the town i was just like holy crap this place is amazing driving up into from the south into marfa with the landscape it was a landscape that i hadn't really seen before those colors the way they kind of come together is something that completely inspired me and blew my mind and I remember just after two short days of Marfa you know and this is entrepreneur Eric because I definitely have an entrepreneur mindset that's all I think about I feel like it's like you know oh what would be a fun business idea or an art idea and I left Marfa eastbound with this like 
strong desire to do something there, to participate in that. And that's before I had even had a chance to really explore uh, Judd's work. Uh, you know, I was very naive to the to the broader traditional art world at the time. Uh, I consider myself still very naive, even though I've been kind of catapulted deep into the heart of of kind of like contemporary art uh, uh, conversation. But um, yeah, I just there's something about that landscape that that is not replicated in any other places that I've traveled, and I've been very fortunate to get to travel to a lot of places. And I've, I've, I found it and continue to find it to be one of the most inspiring uh, places in the world. And it's also just like my little happy place. It's a place to get away. Um, in 2021, right when Artbox was getting started way before it made sense for Artbox to have a presence anywhere, um, I remember I accepted an offer on a CryptoPunk zombie. And uh, at the same time, I had kind of been looking at Marple Real Estate and I found this house. I was like, man, that would be a really cool place to just show some of the weird stuff we're working on at Artbox, uh, not sell anything, but just show and like exhibit. And um, so, you know, this CryptoPunk sale came through and I was like, all right, I'm gonna take the money. And I put it straight into buying a house in Marfa. And that eventually became this kind of like home for generative art um, in West Texas and our home for uh, for Artbox. Yeah, it's, it's, go ahead, Jared. I say it's cool because you've inspired uh... You're, we're starting to see the inspiration, obviously, with like Glitch and what Derek's doing coming into it. So I look forward to to seeing how Marfa evolves because of the the seed that you've planted and the inspiration it's brought to you. Yeah, it can be scary. I mean, I, um, I'm i very sensitive in Marfa, right? Like I want to be sensitive to the community and I want to be sensitive to like the tradition and the history that's there. And not be uh, too imposing. And, you know, a lot of that was just not selling anything. I think that was something that was really important to me. When you go to Marfa, especially as a family, there's like five things to do. And a lot of them are trying to sell you something expensive, which is fine. Obviously they're in the middle of the desert and they they, they have to charge a little bit more for stuff. And there's a lot of art, which also has a, a price tag. And, um, you know, I thought it'd be really fun to have a thing where people could just visit and explore something new. And um, seeing other people come into the space can be really terrifying, but then you also... Like Derek is someone that at this point now I consider a close friend and possibly, you know, my biggest mentor within this ecosystem and has demonstrated like a, a sensitivity and, and an appreciation for the same sensitivities that I have about Marfa. And so, you know, hit, hit him and Steve, Stephen uh, going out there and, and doing Glitch and, you know, working with, with their wives on it too, which I think is pretty cool, you know, kind of involving the family a little bit and then really being sensitive to the community and not just kind of like storming in and being like, I'm tech and I'm, you know, coming into your town. It's really aligned with the way that I wanted to enter Marfa. Um, we've we've had our struggles. You know, I did a town hall there a few years ago that was not very well received from the art community in Marfa. And uh, it's, you know, it's change and change is scary and change is different. But um, I couldn't think of a better place to ground this thing that, uh feels so, I mean, you know, when I set out to launch our blogs, I, the, the last thing that I expected was that you and I would be having this conversation right now. Like you could have told me, oh, there's this chance that, you know, your artwork would be, you'd sell your whole, first of all, sell out all those squiggles. Like I'd be like, what are you talking about? There's 10,000 of them. No one's going to want this. Um, and so, you know, the, the intention was always just like, you know, having a, a home for this, uh, this thing that's happening that 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 people um, have to travel to and and decompress on the way there and once they're there really be able to just like immerse themselves not just in that art but all the beautiful things that Marfa uh, has to offer yeah absolutely I mean Jared and I loved being there we we're there last year we'll be back we'll be back every year we can and it does feel like you've retained that culture you know it's kind of like you get away from modern day life to focus on this one thing it Reminds me of you hear about these like uh, boxers that go into the mountains to train. It's like you kind of get away from it all and and you can focus on that. And uh, I loved it there, you know, between the galleries that probably the, my next favorite thing was Marfa Burrito. Feels like there's all sorts of culture there that um, you and Derek and others are, who are stewards of that culture have, have been able to maintain well. So I think uh, so far it's been fantastic and, and I'm sure you guys will do a great job there. Uh, I, I wanted to turn back a tiny bit because we we do have a couple questions for you about the squiggle but you mentioned that you were collecting photography and then when the squiggle came up you had sold a couple sculptures sculptures excuse me and I was curious like at what point did you start seeing yourself as an artist 
And uh, and maybe as a follow up, like how did you dovetail that artistic intent into the the squiggle? You know, how did you kind of progress into that uh, well, that work? It- it happened the other way around. I mean, I created the squiggle originally as a proof of concept. And, you know, I, I, I would admit that I did not give myself credit um, in terms of the artistic intent. I think I've always felt massive imposter syndrome, as many people do in this space. And I feel like, you know, having labeled the chromie squiggle as an artwork, even if it was this thing that I had spent an insane amount of time working on and refining and thinking about, and uh, it just felt precocious. And, uh, honestly, the first time I was ever introduced formally as an artist, um, kind of in a broad room, was at CES in 2022. Uh, Leslie Silverman, which works with uh, UTA, who you know works with me on 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 a lot of really fun stuff, uh, introduced me in front of a bunch of people at CES as like an artist. And uh, I people had referred to me as an artist before that, but that was a moment that like r- r- to this day it just kind of like is is the moment where I finally maybe acknowledged that there was. Um, something to what I was creating beyond it being a, a product or a, you know, cause I am an entrepreneur and generally there's a, there's a division between entrepreneurship and like business and then also creating um, creative things. And so, you know, I, 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 I love the idea that by being able to be called an artist, I might be able to have a deeper emotional connection with the people that are viewing the work versus somebody looking at something as purely a product. And it really wasn't until that time, until that moment that I started to give myself credit for for having been an artist, I, I think that a lot of the things that happen in the NFT space today are performance art in in a weird way. Like it, with art blocks, we are celebrating that moment of minting and like you know the artist and the collector being present for it, and um, it, it it is part of this kind of of the times art movement of what we're kind of talking about. And um, you know, I I I'm I'm really excited to be able to kind of embrace that in in. A little bit more acknowledgement of like uh create you know things people maybe being interested in and uh not just the visual things that i create but also the things that i have to say yeah absolutely and you know it's funny as, as you're saying that like i i grew up not feeling like i was creative at all because i was terrible at the creative arts like you know i'm indian so i like math and science but i'm just kidding but you know that that's kind of like what you're told to focus on uh, but i i feel like the entrepreneurship is certainly a form of creativity and one could even argue a form of art i mean you're kind of building a system and putting it together in a new way infusing technology perhaps and i got to think that some of your artistic interests and practices before dovetailed into the entrepreneurship and, uh, you know, I, I didn't really have a question there, but it's just more of a, a comment and a thought that I, I feel like these things go together more than is is traditionally appreciated. Like we draw these sort of boundaries around them as if they're very distinct, uh, not not you and I, but just in general in the, in the yeah. common mind share. And you know, I, I did want to ask you is, you know, these days. Uh, do you do you have an artistic practice you're keeping up? Like I know you had the uh, Proof Grails release with some of the ceramics. I've been seeing some uh, posts of yours around ceramics. I'm I'm curious, what are you up to these days to keep scratching that itch? Well, a lot of the artistic stuff um, is really just trying to find overlap with things I can do with my kids, because I don't spend nearly enough time with my kids, and I think the hardest part of all of this is like having so much separation from my family because of all the travel and just like the long hours of meetings and stuff. Um, I'd say that there's a, uh, a, it's just beautiful that I, we bought a house last year or two years ago that had a kiln in it and, uh, they moved everything out and were like, Hey, can you just leave the kiln there? And so we were able to, you know, buy a kiln and it was, it already had a place and, uh, that allowed me to kind of start dabbling in ceramics. Something else my brother is very, very, um, uh, familiar with and something that like, I don't know if I'd be able to do this if it wasn't for his early coaching kind of, and just, you know, how to, how to, how to even just work a kiln. This kiln is like 30 years old, you know, they, there's no internet information on like really how to use it. And you'd be surprised how esoteric ceramics are in terms of finding information on the internet. It's a, obviously there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of information about making ceramics, but about like the, the firing process, like there's just so much uncertainty to me at least. And it's something that I've had to spend a lot of time working through. Uh, I think, if um if i you know besides spending more time with my family if i could if i could make a change in my life it would be that i'd be able to more uh directly focus on the artistic practice i think i think you're right in that you know the um there there maybe is an opportunity to blur the lines a little bit between entrepreneurship and if you think about 
you know, uh, entrepreneurship is trying to understand like what gets people excited and what gets people motivated to make a purchasing decision. Uh, you know, art starts from a different direction in that, you know, you want to express yourself and you put something out there that says like, this represents me, or this is a commentary on society, or this is a commentary on a specific action or, or, or idea. Um, but in the end, like there is um, and a, a thought that it's like, well, you know, also hopefully some, especially if you're a full-time artist, like someone also has to kind of want to own this thing. Um, and I think uh, being able to like spend a little bit more time focused more on the creation of the art versus like the entrepreneurial side of, of uh, you know, what art box looks like and what the offering looks like would be really welcome. But I also, uh, you know, I've taken this, you know, this could have been a hobby and it could have stayed a hobby and it could have been a much smaller organization. And, you know, I made the decision to kind of make this thing. I thought there was potential for this to be much bigger than what we saw in 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 early 2021 and um so you know i i took that responsibility upon myself and i i have the rest of my life to really get to focus on art and um and especially as like the organization matures and gives me a little bit more opportunity to have like i don't know a nine to five job um and staying home more often so i think there will be plenty of opportunity in the future and in the meantime i have one or two projects that i'll probably get around to releasing every year that involve um you know art blocks technology and generative technology in fact the the proof piece is something i'm hoping to release later this year with the venus over manhattan the gallery that i get to work with but as a as a truly generative piece right so um you know i anytime i'm making ceramics with my kids i'm making more bowls like the ones that were in that photo and my 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 goal is to uh you know maybe third quarter of this year release an artwork where you know, there's 50 bowls stored on IPFS and the gradient is created because that was created algorithmically. And there's a there's a function that randomly grabs one, two or three bowls, randomly creates a gradient and randomly inserts it onto the um, onto the background and then creates the drop shadow, which kind of made it look like the bowl was actually sitting on a generative piece. And, uh, you know, it it's something that I occasionally get to spend an hour here, an hour there at night, and I will probably start staying up all night in July because, you know, I'll actually have to like really make progress on it. Uh, it's a bit derailing, but also I think without that, um, I, I I may not feel as fulfilled uh, in, in terms of like, I'm really excited about this technology and I'm really excited about putting it to use. And I'm, I love seeing artists put it to use and, and that makes me want to put it to use even more, you know, so, you know, taking advantage of what we've, what we've been building as a team and demonstrating further what can be done with this technology is really important to me. And uh, um, those are, those are ways that I can do that. Yeah, your your obsession with marrying the digital and the physical has been really inspiring. I mean, even seeing like the 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 partnership with G on the ninety CC shirt, but also, I mean, the the generative sweaters that are coming out with the squiggle inspiration are just so fun Super to watch. Excited. But yeah. dude, I'm like, sign me up! I can't wait. Uh, you seem from an outside, you seem like somebody who's obsessed with the process, right? Like at least just listening to you here, like uh, develop, doing, developing your, I mean, I had an obsession with developing my own black and white photography too. I similarly oh, nice. turned my, my spare garage into a, a black or, or a dark room. And I'd spend hours trying to reproduce, um, you know, Ansel Adams photos. So like that, that's a, that's a process, you know, spending time with your family through uh, pottery. And I mean, that, that's a process I, I've tried to throw clay and it's absolutely impossible for me. It's like I have two left hands or something. And I think that, um, you know, even with art blocks, like I think I, I've taken a step back and, uh, you know, listen to a lot of what you've put out there and consume that content. But, you know, you you learn to code in order to create it. Like you seem somebody who's very obsessed with the process. So I know that you you state entrepreneur first, but I think that at least as an observation, both have somewhat inspired each other. And then that, that constant, and P and I come from an engineering background. So I think the process and tinkering are, are somewhat native to us also. And maybe that's why I'm pulling at this thread a little bit more than, than I should, but I really do admire how you've been able to have that persistence and and the tinkering, whether it's, you know, entrepreneurship artist, um, or even just creating. Um, so I kind of wanted to take that and go back to the Chromie squiggle and double click on that. Like, What's the origin story of the the squiggle? You mentioned, and I say this because you mentioned that the squiggle came before some of the sculpture. 
So that that to me is indicative of you've been thinking about it for or had been thinking about it for some time and there was a process behind the squiggle. So I guess ultimately is what is the origin story for everybody and and what was the process? Can you run me through Snowflow's yeah. vision? So you know, it's interesting cuz it, what you just said too a little bit about what comes ahead of the other in in any example of a business that I've had success in um there was a desire for that business to exist that didn't exist. It was my desire. It wasn't like, oh, I bet you a bunch of people would want to buy snow cones on the drag in Austin. It was like, gosh, it's hot here. It would be really cool if there was a snow cone stand here and then being like, oh yeah, I'll start a snow cone stand in Austin. Or in the ceramic tile business, you know, it was like, I hated tile growing up. It was awful. It was like this daily thing that I had, because my dad was in the ceramic tile business. And then I saw a different kind of tile that I liked. And I was like, oh man, like, I like that. Like nobody else is selling that. How do I make that available to the to the public? And same similar with our blocks. Like there was this desire to create a platform that other people could could do something with because I wanted a platform to do this thing. And what what it kind of boils down to with the Chromie Squiggle was, uh, you know, there's a there's a whole other thing that I've I've kind of maybe known this my whole life, but I haven't actually been faced with the reality of it nearly as much as I have recently. In that, I have a very hard. I can communicate thoughts. I have a very hard time communicating a vision. And, uh, you know, that's d- demonstrated by the DMs that I have with many, many of the artists that you see today in the art box and the outside ecosystem from 2018, where I'm like, hey, I'm working on this crazy thing. And, uh, you know, you should come do it. And they're like, ah, dude, you're crazy. You know, like, this is never going to work, whatever. Um, the Chromie Squiggle was a desire to demonstrate the process. And, um you know, my brother had also created Genesis, which was released on day one of our box as an example of how to generate, how to, how to do the process, but something less authentic felt to me that I'm sitting here trying, like, I'm a huge fan of these artists. I also code, I tinker with generative art. I've been making generative art for a long time at this point. And something that would, it felt more authentic if I was presenting them with something that I created myself. Uh, also something that reflected some of my values and some of like who I am. And, you know, like I, I've said this before, like I, my goal in, in, as an artist is to make people smile and to like, you know, hopefully make their day one tenth of a percent better by by creating or saying things or, or doing things to inspire them and motivate them to be a better person. And, um, the you know, the Chromie Squiggle started out as me tinkering actually with 3JS, which is a, a library that a lot of artists use on our blocks um and uh learning how to use it and going through the different example files in 3js to see how people made stuff and um i also have a background in uh in the ceramics industry i was often the person that was helping people make gradients so when we see any kind of gradient on screen there's like so many tiny little pixels that it looks like a smooth line but anything bigger than that especially with tile which is like one inch by one inch or bigger you have to really understand how to stipple or how to like dither, uh, which is mixing colors uh, uh, across. Like if you just do stripes, it looks like a rainbow. But if you mix those colors between the stripes of color, then it looks like a smoother gradient. And that's something that I actually spent years working on is how to help people achieve gradients and not rainbow color gradients because t- uh, color in tile is very rare or was more rare at the time. But just like going from gray to white or from black to white or whatever. And it's something that I found uh, that I was good at. And it was a mathematical process that I got really excited about. Um, and so when I started dealing with like 3JS and starting to figure out like, you know, how to use it, because I was really excited. In fact, when uh, I first started using uh, dealing with Artbox, there was no code on chain. All of a sudden, when like I decided that it would make a lot of sense to put that algorithm on chain, I was like, well, what can we put on chain? And then I started looking at these major libraries. 3JS was one of them. And again, I didn't, I couldn't go back to my brother and be like, hey, can you make a 3JS project and a P5JS project? And and so I thought I would make my own 3JS project. And that's where I learned kind of some of the mechanics of the Chromie Squiggle, which was at the time, a, like 2000 spheres that go along a soft curve. Um, when I applied the color, kind of more signature color uh, theory that I have, which is gradients and kind of like smooth transitions to this curvy line, I looked at it and I was like, that's kind of dumb, but like, I've also never seen it before. Like I've never really kind of seen something, you know, and there's like some, there's some examples of like squiggly lines that are rainbow, but at that, at that, um, like it just stood out to me as something unique, but I didn't really recognize the uniqueness of it until I spent the next two years showing that project as an example project to artists and to, uh, you know, well, mostly artists 
to exemplify just how much variability can happen within uh, a generative piece that's minted on the blockchain. And over that time, I, I got even more motivated in the fact that like over two or three years being deep in the design world, because I come from the design world, there were no there were no cues of this within the design world. It's like, you know, it's so hard to, I mean, to make something that is just stupid simple, like so clean and simple and be recognizable as being the thing that it is. It's something that I stumbled into. It definitely was not my intent. Um, but, you know, as I started to really understand that people would be able to identify a Chromie Squiggle as a Chromie Squiggle amongst the noise of all of the other design elements, I started leaning up even more into it and started giving it a little bit more um, credit as being not just this like random proof of concept, which going back to that a little bit, um, a line with a bunch of points is one of the easiest ways to demonstrate variability because you can have an infinite number of points and an infinite number of places along the chart for those points to lie, and then you connect it with a line. Um, so, you know, it, like the purpose was served that it demonstrated variability. I was able to add more variability by implementing some of my color um, aesthetics that I like to use into like my sculptural works that I was making at the time, 3D printed sculptural pieces that I hand mixed colors and, and glued together. Um, and it just all kind of came together into uh, this thing that I just slowly became fiercely proud of and so proud, in fact, because originally uh, I was not going to release it on our blogs. Uh, originally, it was just a proof of concept, y'all. And uh, it wasn't actually until I, I released it on the testnet version of Artbox where I'd be in crypto voxels and like teaching people what Artbox was. And I created some really fun, like I created a little red button in crypto voxels that would trigger a mint on testnet. And then the mint would appear in crypto voxels, which to this day, I haven't seen that done yet. And I really want to see that done. Like for an Artbox release, that'd be a really cool way to release it. Of course, gaming, that shit is so easy these days. So it's hard to um, prevent people from botting something that's in, in the 3D space. Um, but yeah, that that kind of uh, that test net period where people would reach out and DM me and be like, by the way, I minted one of these these little squiggly lines and I can't wait to see these on mainnet. And my response would be like, well, actually, they're not going to be on mainnet. And their response would be like, what are you talking about? Like, I want one of these. And that further gave me conviction to then eventually release the Chromie Squiggle as part of Artbox. In fact, if you ask Danny and uh, and Jeff, uh, it wasn't maybe a, a week or two before launching Artblocks that I changed my mind and added the squiggle. But originally, Project Zero was going to, the Genesis project was going to be Danny's project, and Construction Token was going to be project number one. And it wasn't, but a couple weeks before that, that I was like, hey guys, like, are y'all okay with me adding this? And just because I created this thing and I, you know, I kind of started associating with a signature, I made it Project Zero and um, it became, uh, yeah, they were fine with it, of course, which is gracious of them because they had already kind of planned on being the first two projects. and. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it is what it is from there. <laughs> For what it's worth, I, I equate the Chromie squiggle to a, a Jackson Pollock because to me, it's when you initially see it, at least this was my initial reaction to, to Pollock's work was I could do that. It, it's so relatable because it feels so attainable if that makes any sense and then as you dig into the complexity of the work you realize holy shit this is like way beyond my my grasp and uh you know somebody you've been calling out lately is like nifty 50 and i from the squiggle dow have been have really like bonded over like the the algorithm and and the all the stuff that's out there that isn't necessarily in the metadata and it's partially why p and i related so i i love the project and i, I thought i'd share this at least uh, my my ten percent uh, shows up every day. I, you can't really see it due to the blur, but my my fresh squiggle mint from Venus over Manhattan sits on my desk every single day and, and brings a little bit of smile. So, oh man, that's that's really awesome to hear. I, I love that those those frames exist. Infinite Objects really killed it, I think, with that and like just made it possible to bring these things into people's homes more than a lot of the NFTs that we that we see in the space. It's really hard to yeah, no, live it's with our it's art. awesome. And anybody who comes into my office always asks me what it is, and I, I've even brought it to my uh, to my banker and and showed them what? like what is this oh digital God. art stuff? And I'm like, well, this is the perfect representation of it. So wow. not only does it bring me joy, but it's been uh, bringing joy to people all across Idaho. Chromie That's Squiggle awesome. close, closing deals. Yeah, closing right? deals with the squiggle. No, that that that's amazing. I mean, I think it's so cool to hear how you were thinking about it and how you really systematically added different features in it to it to demonstrate the you know like 
showing the complexity, the fact that it is a unique design uh, element. I know that's not the word you used. I, I don't come from a design background, but I understand what you're saying is that there is a uniqueness to it that would make it distinct. And it's, uh, yeah, it's brilliant. And I love how you infused the variety into it to showcase the, the power of generative art and these generative systems. I do have to ask, because we normally dive deep into these, but I got to ask you, how did you come up with the concept of the six different types, you know, kind of arguably the most, uh, the easiest to visually see distinctiveness in the, and it, how did you decide on those ones? Well, the hyper was decided in 2018 when I first came out with the Chromie Squiggle. In fact, uh, in 2018, I gifted 2000 printed Chromie Squiggles to uh, interior designers in Houston. I got these little acrylic frames and stuck them inside the frames and just gifted them out to people with instructions to claim this thing called an interface token, which at the time was going to be the only NFT within the art blocks ecosystem. It was going to be like you carrying your, you would carry your hash string around to different projects instead of minting new hash strings for each project. Anyways, that was not, I think, the right approach for art blocks and that has been abandoned. But um out of the 2,000 people, 14 of them minted them, right? And um, and those people then received a real squiggle when like the Chromie squiggle released in 2020. But the reason I bring that up is because in that case, the squiggle was a lot more noodly. It was really thin. Uh, and the hyper was way more uh, tight of a spectrum than you see it today. So today you see more of the rainbows. Back then the hyper almost looked gray because all the colors were like really squished on top of each other. But it was just a very simple switch of a variable where instead of the color being spread out, multiple over multiple squiggles you had multiple cycles of color spread out over very small sections of the squiggle um but you know as 2018 2019 you know i'm tinkering with art blocks giving up on art blocks getting back into art blocks as a concept um you know i i would just whittle away at that script like i i just remember one day uh, i was working on it and i remember my wife was walking by and i was like look and all i had done was increase the thickness of the squiggle um, I don't know why I had never really done that before. Maybe I was just tinkering with too many other things. All I did was make the circles a little bit bigger and it are already automatically looked so much more substantial. It looked like so much more interesting to me. And I was like, wait a minute, like this is even this is even more interesting than the little noodly thing. And so then I was like, well, what if I make it really big? And then that's where the bold came from. And um, I was like, this is too cool for them all to be bold. Like they're chunky and like, it's just a different kind. So, you know, I was like, well, I mean, I guess we have the hyper rainbow, which is already kind of a rare thing. I'm going to add the bold element to this. That's cool. So now I have regular bold and hyper. And then I was like, well, what if I just start messing around? And, um, slinky was a, uh, intentional, um, trait. The ribbed was a happy little accident that came as a result of tinkering with the slinky, the pipes was a, also kind of an accident, but also kind of intentional in that like I ex expanded on the slinky and and uh, um, uh, added some just kind of like, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, grounding at each of the control points. Um, the, the fuzzy was intentional, but I didn't think it was going to look fuzzy when I did it. I was like, oh, I'm going to do tiny little circles and spread them out. And yeah, it was that that took about six months. That was about six months of once I decided what the final weight of the squiggle was, which I, I would admit that it was a three-year process to determine what the actual weight, uh, a two-year process, what the actual weight of the chromie squiggle was going to be, then expanding it beyond that into all the other things felt natural, but it would be it, it would have been putting the cart ahead of the horse to start adding all of those traits when I wasn't fully convinced that the current form, which is the, the kind of noodly form, was the final form of the chromie squiggle. Oh, I, I go ahead, Jared. I know you want to talk about your bold. No, no, I was just gonna say we're <laughs> we're both bold owners, and we're very grateful for you tinkering with the the size because it is now my <laughs> online identity as a bold. So I thank love you. that. I remember when you made that uh, when you yeah. when you shared that. Yeah, then, mine uh, mine is a pipe. I mean, I I love it. I'm like obsessed with it. Uh, and what I was uh, gonna say is. It's history in the making. You have the first pipe ever minted. He was able to. Uh, oh wow to acquire that so it's it's a uh, i've told him i want to buy i want to have the first opportunity to buy it when it when it moves but i probably won't have enough money but it uh it, it it's a pretty cool piece what number yeah. is that is that 70 something 74 yeah 74. i wow. i got lucky with that i just knew it was a day zero i didn't know it was the first one and it dropped the mark and i was like i need to buy this right now i just Dude, just come in some so liquidity cool. so 
I wow. didn't didn't mint it, but uh, yeah, I got super lucky with that one. And we're both uh, very grateful for Tiger with Pauls. I'm sure you probably know who it is, uh, as do I. But I I got squiggle number eight also just recently from from them. So oh, that's cool. We have we both have uh, pieces of of art blocks and squiggle history. Number eight, that's awesome. Top ten, holy crap. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean it's it's amazing, and it's so it's 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 crazy how much joy it brings to us as collectors, tons of collectors, and it's so cool to see these days. Uh, every day, I feel like, or maybe every, at least every week, I see somebody on my Twitter timeline that's like, "Oh, I finally got a squiggle," and it's just like uh, it's such a cool community that's building around it. So, just want to say kudos to you for that, and you know, uh, it, just amazing from you know you talk about an entrepreneurial standpoint and an art standpoint to to create it something that resonates so well i just hope people understand that it is completely surreal even today when people are like i finally got a squiggle or they share their signature as a squiggle like it is not i don't know you know I, i've said this in the past maybe like in a year or two i can like finally sit in a hammock for more than an hour and like soak it in and try to figure all this out but right now it's like it's not really even happening you know and sometimes i don't even know how to respond or react when i see it on twitter i'm just like Sometimes I just want to go crawl under a rock and I'm just like, what is going on? Like, this is oh, insane, man. but I feel very awesome. proud, very honored. And like, uh, um, I don't know. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I saw a chart the other day of like, you know, some of the top NFT projects just in general. And when I think about, you know, I, I told you at the beginning, like, I don't love talking about the finances of this thing, but just from purely a, you know, the fact that I was able to create something that has, uh, been able to be at the top of some of these charts in terms of like recognition or adoption or acceptance is it's just uh yeah it's unbelievable uh, even hearing how much uh, time you put into this and thought i mean it's 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 no accident with the amount of uh attention and, and pride that you took into it i mean i know you said you were you you weren't necessarily great at communicating your vision earlier in the in the dialogue here but i actually because i wrote this down i said I think your strength, one of your superpowers is actually your vision comes through execution. And I think that's one thing that I've really come to admire about you and art blocks and everybody associated with you is like you guys execute at a, a very high level. And I think it it really stems from the, you know, the intent that you've put out there and, and what you're doing. So I know you're very humble and whatnot, but it it's really cool. You're you're doing a lot of amazing stuff for the space and and your Silly little squiggle is inspiring a lot of people. And and I think there's going to be a lot of people who look back on it in history and, and derive a lot of inspiration from it. it. It's it's really cool to see. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just piggybacking on that, and it's actually a great transition to talking about you as a creator, but probably, I, I got to imagine part of the reason it feels so surreal is because it, it's been so long in the making. I mean, you, you talked about the art itself, but the concepts that you were trying to demonstrate with the art were things that I have to imagine were swimming around in your mind for quite some time. And, you know, so I'd love to go back and hear about your story of how you got into web three. I mean, we all have a story about when we first heard about blockchain and ignored it for a while and then finally figured out what it could be. And it's like, Oh crap, this is like really, really interesting. Um, how, yeah. How did you get sucked into web three in the first place? Well, the first person to ever tell me about it was once again my brother. Um, you know, and I remember we were at a Papacitos restaurant here in Houston, and he was telling me about Bitcoin and mining and thumb drive mining. And I was like, I was like, should I get one? He's like, no, nah, it's too late. Like those thumb drives don't even mine that much anymore. Because at that point, it had just. And I was like, well, why are you telling me this, dude? Like, what the hell? Like, uh, but it, you know, we've always kind of bonded on technology and. Uh, and you know, he was sharing something that he was excited about, and I think he might even have been mining a little bit at the time, but. Um, uh, a couple years passed. I I spent a lot of time on Reddit um, in my life. Like that was my go-to before Discord and now Twitter. Um, and I just you know casually would just run across, across threads on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Um, bought my first part of a Bitcoin in December of 2016 and finished that entire Bitcoin on New Year's Eve, like right kind of at midnight. I was like, I can't go into 2017 without a whole Bitcoin. Uh, it was 800 bucks at the time. That was an insane amount of money for me to be like kind of burning. I, I remember those days. I remember those yeah. days. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, I was like, this is cool. And then I bought another one and then I bought this. And then I was like, what's this scam thing that's like $7 for it? You know, it was Ethereum. And I was like, well, I mean, 
we already have Bitcoin. Why do we need another one? Like, this is clearly like just a marketing scam. I, you know, like just with anything else, it's like, well, this is the real thing. Uh, and so I ignored it for, for a couple of weeks. And then um, on Reddit, I kind of now started spending more time on Bitcoin and started reading about Ethereum. And I was like, oh, wait, this is totally different. This is a whole different animal. And so I went and I remember I bought a significant amount of Ethereum, the most Ethereum that I will ever have had in my life. And um, uh, and then, you know, I started going up in value, which is interesting. I had a very interesting 2017, 2018, as many people did, um, did not sell anything. So I started... I, I ended with like the crowd. 15% more than I invested. <laughs> so, hey, I didn't lose money, but, um, you know, I don't know how, if this applies to y'all, but like there was this Blockfolio app that eventually became the FTX app. And if you look through my pictures during that year, it's like me taking screen captures of that and sending it to my wife. Like, look what's going on. Like, what it, the fuck is going on? Like, if you're like me, you probably recognize names like Neo and Stellar Lumens and oh, Golem yeah. oh, and, what, and all Neo, sorts Pivx. of stuff. Oh, I had like, I had like, uh, I think 150 masternodes running at any given moment. Oh, yeah, wow. I was helping people. What I was doing in the Punks Discord in 2018 later and like helping onboard people into Ethereum was me onboarding people into masternodes and writing scripts and helping people like create masternodes and. I had like an app that would text me every time I got like a new payout from the monetary unit masternet, which was 18 bucks every time. And it'd be like every three minutes, I'd get like a little buzz and I'd be like, what, like, what is going on in this world? But of course I never sold any of it. I just kept it all. Um, the uh, 2017 thing was just like, it, 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 this, the, the discovery of programming money and making money smart to me. And I've never really been a super financially driven person, but I'm a very tech curious person. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a tinfoil person, but I, I even even back to 2016 have just like slowly grown this like doubt in trust of just inability to trust people, especially like political figures. And just like as I've learned more about, I mean, I, I wasn't really a political uh, person younger in life. And then when you learn more about lobbying and like corporate interests and stuff, like you start to realize like gosh, like I just don't even know who to trust anymore. And so that was kind of aligned with this idea of like programming money and being able to like understand like provenance and consensus infrastructure. Um, and um, in 2017, I discovered Ethereum, well, like fell wildly in love with it. I, I even created an app, for example, that I was in the shipping of, in the ceramic tile business. And I started writing like very simple app infrastructure for tracking container ships with what was in them where like the smart contract was locked until it arrived. And so then you would have like a, just like opening a container that's sealed, you would have like a sealed report of everything that was inside of it. Um, and then, you know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about, uh, I, I also collected Magic the Gathering when I was a kid and like just kind of understanding uh, collectability. And I never really put my finger on exactly what I was thinking about until in, 2000, in June of 2017, I was browsing Reddit and I saw the link for the CryptoPunks project that was posted by Larva Labs. And I clicked on it. And like, I just, I mean, I can remember it like it was yesterday. It just like everything just came together. And I was like, holy shit, like this is, this is the future. Like I was just like looking at this thing and I felt like a, sometimes like in a, in a comic book or whatever, where you see someone looking into like a crystal ball. Like I was like looking at my computer screen going like, holy, like this is going to be insane uh, because it finally connected the dots first from a generative perspective because crypto punks are generative and I very much believe their art, even if not everybody else agrees. Uh, but also from the provable ownership of a digital asset, the idea that you could, you know, not just prove the ownership, but show the provenance of it. Like it just, it just completely blew my mind. And I, I, I scrambled to sync the Ethereum blockchain because at the time I was running a wallet that you had to sync the entire blockchain to operate on it. It took forever. I watched the last ape be claimed like in front of my eyes because I kept checking because that's the one, that's what I was scrambling for. And then when I was able to sync it, I was able to um, uh, uh, claim 34 zombies uh, the last 34 zombies. So, you know, other people were either not aware of the fact that they were rare uh, or they didn't care or they were drawn by aesthetics. And I was like, no, 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 these are like, they talk about these in the paragraph at the top. I have to get these, you know? Um, and I guess the, the, the beautiful thing is that literally as I'm claiming those with understanding of generative art, with understanding of smart contracts, because at that point I had already built a couple smart contracts and been tinkering and participated in some ICOs. And there was a website called Etherroll that you could like play uh, dice games and you know whatever 
uh, I was thinking as I was claiming these, like, man, it's not fair that I get to take all these zombies. And I know enough about humans to know that if I didn't, the next person would. And like that, like, I'm sorry, like uh, maybe I could have shared more of the zombies, but there was plenty of more punks to have. But I just remember uh, thinking like, I know the blockchain can, you know, I know the blockchain is deterministic and I know that there's no way to like a hundred percent guarantee like true randomness, but I know the blockchain can generate the data that's necessary for me to just click claim and to be presented with a punk that was randomly selected out of the 10,000 instead of me getting to go in and manually pick the ones that I wanted. And that was that was literally the the, the very first moment that I thought about Artbox as like potentially as a platform and using the Ethereum blockchain as a way to uh, not just help people pick art, but to distribute art. Because one of the things that I was thinking as I'm picking these is like, well, imagine if they wanted to get 10,000 of these things out to other people not using blockchain technology like how would they do that like you could have a server and say hey everybody sign up for my mailing list and then like randomly distribute them that way but like the the beauty of the distribution mechanism of the technology and and it, it just all kind of came together and um yeah I, I i can remember like it was yesterday like the amount of joy and excitement um to even just use the technology <laughs> Because back yeah. then there was only a few things you could do with the technology, like just to have a really good reason to like execute a smart contract transaction. No, I, I remember my Ether wallet and a lot of these other ones that were just like, I mean, it was like so cumbersome to get everything to work it appropriately. Was. There was no it was MetaMask. Very frustrating. There was a video game I played that cost two ETH per turn. Uh, and the turn was done on my Ether wallet by calling a smart contract function. And then you would see it on the website kind of like change and uh you know but two ETH was 14 bucks which is still ridiculous like for a turn in a game but i was just like oh no no, no. like i just want to play with this like let's just play these games like find use cases for the technology so no, I, yeah. I i i look back and i i'm the amount of eth burned yeah, just tinkering so, i'm like oh my so god sad. if i if i i knew but i didn't know if you know what i mean how depressing just, oh my god. yeah well and it, it's it's like for for a lot of us i'll talk about myself it was the first time we learned about trading and you know financial markets and these types of things in general. I mean, it's, it's making me smile because there's so many things you said that are like similar, you know, I used to collect magic gathering cards. I'm like, yes, you know, being a, a nerd playing at lunch in eighth grade, uh, didn't turn out to be the worst thing in the world. Um, and I had a, a similar light bulb moment early in, in 2017 with Ethereum. I, I got to uh, go meet a bunch of the consensus folks because a friend was working there and I was like, whoa, this is, this is really something different. Like this feels like it's going to change the world. Like this is something that I really want to get into and be a part of. And, you know, I got to imagine so many people had such a, an experience early on there and, and you obviously connected a lot of dots there. You know, I wanted to ask you though, as you as, as this culminated, and maybe it didn't uh, it didn't fully hit your mind at the time when you had that vision for art block, seeing the crypto punks. But you know, what what principles did you really try to infuse into art blocks as you were intentionally trying to create it after you know learning about and experiencing the the decentralization, the the, the democratization of opportunity that can come with blockchain, the resistance to central corruption, as you mentioned, that also comes along with blockchain. Um, and also if if it makes sense or if it was something you thought about, the aspect of collectability, right? You've been a collector your whole life, not just of art, but of all these other things that you mentioned earlier on. Like how did you try to infuse that as you were constructing art blocks or the different pieces that would eventually become art blocks? Well, it came off of uh, collecting Top Shot, which kind of was the first massive uh, reinforcement of collectability within this space, especially at the price points that those things were at, right? And, you know, a lot of early art block pieces were at that price point or less too, right? So there was like that opportunity before it kind of exploded. The democratization component was so important to me and that like people spend the same for whatever mint they get regardless. And so, you know, you have this opportunity, anybody has the same chance of getting something rare that and something not rare. Um, but I think I think one of the things that I think is most important in in terms of I remember I had already been through one cycle and I had uh, seen just kind of like the intensity of this ecosystem and seen the amount of money that can be created in this ecosystem and one of the things that really early on I integrated into this based on my previous experience was this idea of a secondary beneficiary within an Artplex project. Um, that's something that was there from day one and the ability for the uh, artist to set a second wallet and they split at the smart contract level 
you know, I've always, I've been, always been someone that has donated like 10 bucks here, 20 bucks here, a hundred dollars maybe to a cause that, you know, and it just depends on how much you can afford to donate. Right. Um, and there's, there's something like I was able to kind of just like think through this idea that like, of course you're very proud to donate, but it also hurts that that money isn't something you can spend on your own stuff. And there's something really powerful about having that money separated from your possession at the smart contract level. And so that that wasn't entirely just for donations. Donations was half of it. The other idea is for collaborations on a project, for two people to work together and not have to trust each other to send half the balance of the project to, to one another. And so one of the early things that, you know, just understanding the collaborative nature of the space, understanding how frantically money can flow in this space uh, and, uh, and seeing, a, a, uh, as with many things in Web3, we have an opportunity to change the status quo and to change the world and to change the way people do things. Uh, building that into the smart contract at the very highest level of the smart contract was something that you know uh, came from just like years of like trying to be involved with philanthropy, but obviously at a very mi minor level, but also be seeing like some crazy amounts go, go um, like change hands and realize that it would be easier for an artist or for an institution to share some of that with like a um, a charitable organization if it was not at the smart contract level and therefore they never touched that money before it left their uh, wallet. Yeah, I mean, I've seen certain artists, I won't name names, but like who have done that early on, even with what you just did for ALS. I mean, it's really cool to be able to have that mechanism, which leads me to, I mean, you talked about observing stuff at the the punks claim obviously thinking about this split early on were there any other like early decisions for artblux that in hindsight like you think were you know like impactful or the right decision that maybe in the moment didn't seem as like as pivotal uh there's many um i think the curatorial board uh, early on was very important in that I am a person that has a weakness in wanting to say yes to everybody and to like let everybody participate. And um, there's two ways to look at like participation, early participation in our, our blocks. It was like, yes, I wanted everybody to release stuff, but there was not enough bandwidth. Like every single project consumed a whole week for me. And then like on the day of the mint and then after the mint and when something would go wrong. And so having to start making selections and separating that selection from myself, I think ended up being really important because building a camaraderie with an artist and then like three months later being like oh yeah by the way like i can't let this be on the platform it 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 can feel uh like too dictatorial and that's just not who i am i'm, I'm I, I like to be an inclusive person i want to help people like release their work the whole point of art blocks was to let people release their work i just didn't expect that much interest and that much demand from the artist perspective to release the work so the curatorial board just kind of being a early way to separate myself personally as like the founder and as like, you know, another artist on the platform uh, from the decision-making of like who gets to release on the platform, kind of creating a second layer of accountability for that, I think is a, a decision that was done early on. Potentially it was a decision made based on weakness that I recognized within, uh, you know, who I am. Um, but one that I think eventually during, uh, you know, as our block started to grow, a lot of the press that we got was based on the idea that we were decentral. Well, it wasn't decentralized curation, but separating curation from the platform itself and kind of letting experts um, be the deciders of what actually was released on our box as a curated project or not. We're always here to sit on the board if you ever need any help. Hey, soon we'll. I, I really hope to start seeing some rotating uh, uh, community seats on the board. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully we'll see that in the next few months. And uh, I, I have no idea. I think the hardest part, this is the hard part with decentralization. It's like we, we thirst for decentralization. And then you're just like, okay, but how do we pick those people? And like, how do you make sure that doesn't get civil attacked when you vote for the person for the board? Like, it's, it's actually quite a mess. Like, there's no, the, like, the value proposition of decentralization is such a shit show. And that like, I'm such a fan and such a supporter of it, yet after having launched Artbox, not having a good way to raffle 20 squiggles. Like, how the hell do I raffle 20 squiggles without knowing, without thinking someone's going to game it, whether they go create 100 email addresses or they go create 100 Ethereum addresses. Like, it is really a shame that I can't once a week do a totally provably fair raffle unless we start KYCing. And then even then, if it's a $20,000 thing, there's a really good chance that people are going to go and like, I don't know, figure out a way to get around KYC to get these things. And um it's just it decentralization is really a double double edged sword that we we uh you know I I remember just early on 
being attacked pretty heavily in our box discord and being like guys we cannot embrace decentralization and also fight it at the same time we have to like it's it's like look at all the good things that come with it we have to deal with if it was a perfect technology we'd be in a different place but it's not perfect it's fantastic it's innovative but it's not perfect and we really kind of have to like you know work with what we've got yeah i mean no no system is ever perfect right and uh, i i love just thinking about systems i i often I mean, this is a slight tangent, but I often think about natural systems and I feel like nature has gone through, you know, trillions of iterations and sometimes we can get a lot of inspiration from that. Um, And your point about decentralization is well taken. I mean, it's hard to keep a level of fidelity while also keeping it truly decentralized because there is the possibility that whoever ends up with that $20,000 squiggle does something terrible with it. And that's the real tension there. I think you guys have balanced it really well, though, uh, you know, all things considered, and it's it's early days still, uh, even though it's been a few years, it's, it's early days for this whole decentralization movement with right. the blockchain. A question I had for you around the curation board is, uh, why did you decide to have a curation board or even um, curate projects as opposed to an open platform like FX Hash? Did you, did you consider that early on? I mean, originally our box was meant to be an open platform. I didn't have the technical expertise to build a open platform type infrastructure. Also, I don't have the guts, man, to like handle when someone exercises their right of freedom of speech and decides to make a project of swastikas. Like I I don't actually have the, I that is not within my purview. I, I don't know how to handle that. The blockchain is so immutable. And so it was always meant to be an open platform in that I wanted to give people the ability to put stuff out there, but as long as it was like, not like, you know, flagrant. And uh, when you make it a fully open platform, you set yourself up, you risk, you put yourself up at risk for things to be released on that platform. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's just when we have like, everybody has different levels of risk tolerance. There's a pretty significant risk tolerance by just being in the web three space, like that in and of itself, uh, I think shows that I have a pretty decent high risk tolerance. But when you then add like sentimentality and freedom of speech and things like that to an immutable uh, open source public ledger where somebody can kind of always point to the fact that this thing lives on our blocks that we did not intend to live on our blocks, like th- I got scared and I didn't have the ability to build the infrastructure for people to put their own stuff on the platform. Um, and so I manually had to like handle every single deployment, every single project, handhold artists because the tech now it's like pretty common and standardized like how you release something on our blocks but for a long time like every artist needed six hours of my time individually every single one of them if not more um and so an open platform was just really not even in the cards and given you know we had a couple stumbles along the way where people used code inappropriately or you know and um i am actually very grateful i more more power to the people that have an open platform, like that is more aligned with the value proposition of decentralization and access and fairness. And, you know, we're working on really beautiful things with our Box engine to enable and uh, empower people to create generative content more individualistically and, and to have more control. But with the amount, the layers of complexity that art blocks had six months after launching that were completely unexpected to me and like not anything that would have ever have thought I would be dealing with. Adding that extra layer of complexity of being an open platform might have been the thing that broke me and Artbox would not exist today. I'm just admitting like my human like limitations. Like I was very That's often awesome. close to like not being able to handle it. Um, like at least five different times, you know, everything from nervous breakdowns to just not being able to sleep to just like feeling completely trapped and if you add on top of that that layer of uncertainty that comes with being an open platform it's like as much as i love it and i respect it and i desire it um you have to draw a line somewhere and that was the line that i had to draw and i think that's important for you know for everybody listening and even hearing it coming from you is like creating something that aligns with you i mean even you started off some of the conversation about scratching your own itch and, and, and developing and creating things that that had a resonance with you i think that's okay and i don't think it makes it any less web3 or any less innovative i mean at the end of the day because i think like jordan did like uh what is it uh, prohibition prohibition yeah, on top of the art blocks engine so you know there, there there's a space for others and and i think that 
creating a foundation and the inspiration uh, for others to to do things that align more with their value system while still honoring your own is is something very important for this space. And you know, I was actually talking to an artist two days ago about this, and he was talking about like authenticity in the space and 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 how they're uh, finding ways to to create more authenticity, especially with everything going on in in crypto t- Twitter, crypto Twitter. It, you know, I think that being able to to hear that from you, I I want to just take a moment and applaud you for doing that because that does seem more authentic and it's not necessarily the easier road to take. But it, yeah, and, and Jared, of, uh, just super quickly before you jump into your question, sorry to cut you off, and I want to say that that was by no means a critique. I was just curious no, about oh, the. Yeah. Uh, the decision it makes a lot of sense i think also as you know the first platform in the industry you you want to put a good face forward as well so i think it was 100% the right decision there um without knowing all the the other stuff that was going on behind the scenes but it was my desire for it to be for anybody i just anybody to me was like one out of the five people that would give a shit not one out of 500 people and so i was completely delusional in what what my expectations were of people being interested in releasing on the platform. And to the point on prohibition, I have spent many hours talking to Jordan about prohibition. And, you know, it's like, I feel like such a negative Nancy because a lot of the things I say to him, you know, like uh, not now, cause he's put me at rest, all these things. But I was like, dude, you have some guts, man. Like, like that's literally how I started my conversations with him. Like, Holy crap. Like, how are you handling this? And his responses are very calm. He's like, we have service agreements and we have, like there are there are ways to like make people sign off on the fact that they're not going to do something bad, and um, also they have algorithms to help them with that. He has a background with like machine learning, and those are just things that would require a completely different branch within our business. But he understands them so well that by the time I finish saying my piece, and I, you know, and his responses are just so direct, so comfortable, so clean, and so like confident, I'm like, well, damn, that's all. Like I'm like, all right, sweet. Like I not only am I very proud of what you're building but like i'm very confident that you are going to be fine you know but it's a it's a risk tolerance thing as a founder like what is your risk profile i'm i'm sitting here thinking man you've got like the highest risk risk profile of any of these founders that i've you know that i talk to regularly and his response was very educated and full of information that was like well yeah you st- obviously there's still a risk profile but you've also thought this out very carefully and are very comfortable with what you're building in, in a way that gave me enough comfort you know comfort to to like lay off and just applaud him for for what he's doing so yeah, I've had really excited about him in person we both lived i used to live in southern california so we were able to meet up irl so it's been uh it's it, a good guy. he's a really interesting brain yeah i got to chat with him about it too maybe he uh called it prohibition to subconsciously put that in folks minds you know don't don't mess around with it yeah don't <laughs> don't mess with us yeah, so I cannot wait to see that launch. It's really we've been flirting with the concept of, uh, you know, what is our own tolerance for for risk profiles and and like what are the the boundaries to you know and barriers for for ourselves. I guess that, that kind of prompted me to think about like what are the biggest challenges for this space you feel like there are moving forward, not just for yourself, but like I mean, you touch so many different corners of the of the space and you see so much more you're you're in rooms that most of us could only dream of i imagine and so it's like what is it that you're seeing it's not maybe i'm not looking for alpha but i'm just like trying to scratch at the surface of how how does the mind of of eric uh what what is he looking at what corners is he looking around um yeah i would empathize with anybody that got a glimpse into my brain because it is just like panic generally after panic like from the beginning of our blocks through the good times like it's just always like i think i mean maybe that's a good thing right i'm always like very bullish on the future and then also incredibly uh cautious and uh you know pessimist uh like cautiously optimistic about how how things go on and and so i'm always thinking looking around corners and trying to like make sure that we're not just thinking about our blocks we're not just thinking about our blocks artists collectors but the ecosystem as a whole, because the ecosystem as a whole is hurting right now. And it's hurting for a lot of different reasons. But the number one reason that it's hurting is because people are leaving the ecosystem. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about what brought people into the ecosystem in the first place. And while there are a lot of nerds that might've been brought in because of the technology, a lot of people were brought in based on the proposition of making money. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we should celebrate that because those are the people that got our ideas off the ground and got excited about this ecosystem and and brought more, even more people in. But like, the longevity of this ecosystem is cannot be grounded on 
hey, I saw my friend making money, therefore I'm going to enter this ecosystem and I'm going to make money and tell my friend. And that's how they're going to, that's not sustainable. And, you know, it, sitting around waiting for the next bull run for platforms, for artists, for collectors is not sustainable. And so I'm just, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about what it looks like for us to create not just me, not just Artbox, but like the ecosystem as a whole to create compelling products and, and experiences that are compelling outside of speculation, outside of financialization, outside of um, uh, scarcity. And if you think like for our whole lives, we see a hat and we're like, oh, that's a cool hat. And you just buy the hat. Like you walk into the store and buy the hat and how different that like buying behavior that we've grown. I mean, I'm a 42 year old man at this point, like 40 36 years i guess since i was six that i'd be like maybe saying i want that you know like our whole lives we've had this like buying behavior and the buying behaviors within the web3 space are completely opposite of that like there's nothing shared with that um from a price perspective everything is very expensive even if something's priced as a cheap mint it's still like a hundred dollars for a digital a digital thing like yes there's people that appreciate digital art I'm one of them. And so I can put value on digital art, but like the average consumer that you might go, I mean, you walk into a hundred random homes in a neighborhood and tell me if any of them have any art that is actually um, like either authentic, you know, cause a lot of, I mean, I always had posters in my, in my house, right? Like they have art on their walls because they might have seen like a cute thing to hang on their wall. Some of them have cute little sayings that say like, you know, bless you or whatever, like those that to decorate the walls, not that many people care about art in this world. And of those, then they have to go through this process of caring about digital art that they can't even hang in their homes. And so what, like, we've created a niche, we are living in a niche, and that niche has an opportunity to expand way bigger than anything that we can think of, as has been demonstrated through the 2021 and 2022 bull run. But that niche will not continue to expand until more people are given the opportunity to express curiosity in what we're doing. And right now... Is there's none of that, like very little of, of, of that is happening where people are giving people outside of Web3 an incentive to participate outside of like, you know, financialization. And did you, is I've that been, like, uh, an attempt with friendship bracelets then? Because I mean, that was essentially like, and I don't know, I'm, I'm probably one of the, the, hopefully the blockchain can prove this, but I did exactly what your intent was, is I took one, gifted saved one. it, and I shared one with somebody in, hey. in Italy. And in I'll, Italy. I'll share a, an Italy story with you later, but you know, and, and I think that that was like, to me, it was the, the intent of you gifting too was to onboard people and to bring them in, wrap them into an ecosystem. And I, I see what you're doing there also with like the partnerships with Pace, Venus over Manhattan, like this is about onboarding and expanding the, the network and reach. And yeah, like something with Pace and Venus over Manhattan is, is, is on the financial side, but at the same time, like friendship bracelets to me was, was brilliant because it, it was about the, the inclusion. It was about um education and, and onboarding and i missed i missed the mark there because i thought that they would remain at a 50 dollars price point for a long time based on the massive supply that was available and then even the massive supply that was minted and uh of course very excited about the project because it demonstrates even more things it demonstrates the ability to put instructions into the thing it demonstrates the concept of an ephemeral physical which i think is something that we like don't really spend enough time thinking about um within the uh, web3 ecosystem um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I gifted CryptoPunks to people when they were 20 bucks and those people are very connected to the Web3 space today. And when they got the $20 thing, the last thing they thought was like, oh, I'm going to sell this thing for 50,000 bucks. Like they, but they were kind enough not to throw it away, which is really nice. Um, you know, I, I just think that there's a, the, the most success I've had with onboarding, um, outside of just like the success that our blocks had, which was triggered by incredible art released on the platform and incredible stories and incredible dialogue has been in a disarming way has been in a yeah you know i'm a nerd right yeah this is the thing i'm currently spending my nerdy time on and i want to share this with you i want you to be a part of that and i think friendship racist was an opportunity for you know arguably a lot of people within this ecosystem have some level of nerdiness to even want to operate metamask and um you know this opportunity to kind of share that um as a as an incentive to um, get someone else excited and curious about the ecosystem. And I know a lot of people that their only NFT is a friendship bracelet, um, but that forced them to create a wallet that got them involved in the conversation. And it's a, it's a pretty powerful thing. And the, the, the model of the friendship bracelet, of the ephemeral physical, of the kind of physical optional digital 
product, you know, like I'm expanding that. I'm spending a lot of time working out a thesis and which I'm seeing a lot of activity within the ecosystem around this too, which is pretty cool, but like digital optional, physical optional, you know, like if you like a hat and you love the hat and you think it's a cool hat, like maybe it comes with a digital component, but if you don't care, you just throw the digital component away. Cause like you just bought the hat cause you wanted the hat. But if you actually kept the digital component and you um, found out a year later that if you own the digital version of that hat, you get 50% off your next hat or you get a free hat or you get a free airdrop or whatever. Yeah. That airdrop's not worth the EMS airdrop. That airdrop's not worth 20,000 bucks or even five. It's worth 20 bucks. But it's like, Oh, now I understand like that. It's a, it's that like dotted line to understanding and, 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 and realizing what you're missing out on, not FOMO at the $10,000 level, it's FOMO at the $20 level. And that's how FOMO actually works within society in general. It's like, I'm willing to do what to get a $10 discount for, for dinner. Like, you know, put my business card and deal with people sending emails because I'm going to get a $10. Like this is actually how society operates. And I think that is more likely to onboard more people which then becomes an onboarding mechanism to introduce people more to everything from crypto punks and friendship bracelets to art blocks and everything in between. Um, and over time, like we just, we have a very limited amount of people that are participating in our ecosystem. And I think that growing that would be good for every single person here, everybody, not just art blocks or the artists. I think you said you missed the mark, but I'd challenge you on that respectfully. I, I think you actually hit it right on the mark. And P and I were talking about this you know, in prep for, for this interview, this discussion, this conversation. And, and, you know, the, we were talking about how the Chromi squiggle is now a floor of $20,000. That's out of reach for a lot of people. And, and we look at the, the friendship race as really an opportunity to not only onboard more people, but to, to connect with something. So you, you say you missed the mark, but I, I, I really do believe that it hit the mark perfectly. It allowed people like P and myself to collect full sets to have that connection to the art blocks ecosystem, but also to, to onboard people. Maybe it didn't onboard hundreds of thousands, but to me, this is baby steps and it's the expansion of a system. So I, on I the agree. other hand, I'd like commend you on that, dude. Yeah. And I, 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 I just want to add to that. I, I too gifted one. I didn't do it through the gifting mechanism, but I did send a friend one who wouldn't have, have been able to afford it. He's like, you know, he's like early in college and, and doesn't have any money, but I was like, yeah, like you can have one. And, I agree. I don't I don't think you hit the mark either. I think perhaps we're just early and are not appreciating the the scale of demand that comes from everything you do, right? I think if you release that's a where million feel, of these on the L2. That's where I feel like I missed the mark, right? Like I same with the squiggle. I naively thought that those things would be open for minting for for years. Like I really thought that, you know, forever and I was gonna be able to be like, oh, you think what I'm doing is interesting? Go buy this $20 thing. And it was so naive. And I think that's where I'm kind of commenting on the on the friendship. I said it was meant to be fifty bucks. It hit twelve hundred dollars. Like it, I feel like I kind of like did not think I did not give it enough credit. And and uh, you know, um, uh, you know, also it's beautiful art from Alexi Andre, which just adds like a whole other layer to it. And yeah, I mean, I but I am very proud of it. To be clear, I am proud of the bracelet. I'm very proud of y'all for gifting them to people. Um, and it it really does mean a lot that people can understand what what is going through my head through action and through executing a project. This is the best example of an ephemeral physical that I can think of to this date. It is a great example of how to get attention for what we're doing at Artblocks without trying to sell something new. It it, it the only thing that I missed is the uh, to be perfectly fair is, and these are very fair comments and they always come from a good place. It's like yes, I gifted it, but I kind of wish I didn't when I saw how much the price went up or. Yeah, I had every intention of gifting it, but the price went up so high that, you know, it just didn't make sense. And that's where it's like there was a very strong intention there for these things to kind of maintain a low. They were free. So 50 bucks for 75,000 mints felt pretty reasonable to me. But look, my next projects will once again try to hit that $25 mark and or $50 mark. And uh, I will not stop until I release I something that keeps it. I think you got to make it like a million. Point. Actually, a great example might be Decagons, right? Those are That's unlimited and people yeah, love them and they yeah. love evolving them. And I don't even know how many there are out there, but they're really not worth very much. So I don't, the, the financial side of it is, is completely taken out. And, you know, I, I leaned over cause I wanted to show you this. I got this from a Pepe artist, Pepe Nardo. Oh, there we go. Oh, wow. You can probably kind of see awesome. it yeah. at NFT NYC. And, and I agree with you having that physical and, 
digital component it it draws people in like i love this thing i don't i, I wouldn't sell it i have no idea what it's worth but like why would i it's you know it's it, it's just like a beautiful thing that was given away and i to your point about friendship bracelets i don't think we should um it, they should be beautiful even they can be beautiful and cheap right there's no reason it, it can't be both so i completely agree with you i think if you ever do decide to do the l2 there that would really hit the mark and you just got to go for like a million honestly the supply has to be like but probably whatever you think it should be like 10 X that. And, and that's probably <laughs> what, what you uh, should go for. Uh, but uh, you know, I wanted to ask you a question. You said it earlier, um, even though there are these uh, short-term issues, which uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm optimistic. I think that the community is really, really strong. That's what oh, yeah. both Jared and I fell in love with, with this uh, web three art community is the people are just talented, smart, they care, they're polite. You know, I, I think it's just a fantastic community to be a part of. And I think that's going to keep drawing more people in. And there's a reason people like that are, are self-selecting into this. And I think that's infectious. Um, and, you know, although there has been a lot of financial speculation, the good side of that, from my opinion, is that it's allowed the space to grow faster than it perhaps would have otherwise. Um, but now we're kind of getting the tail of the dragon, so to speak, in that like now that prices are down, it's 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 harder to motivate people to come in and see the good parts of it. But but I do think that'll improve. Obviously, that doesn't mean that we should put our heads in the sand and wait for it to happen. Uh, but I want to ask you, uh, you said that you are long-term bullish and would love to hear what, what has you most hopeful about the space in the long term, despite some of these short-term challenges. Um, well, uh, one thing is seeing artists continue to do amazing things and not just within art blocks. Um, although I just was super re-energized last week with uh, the operator release, just seeing the amount of work and passion that went into that project uh, was, re was reinvigorating for me and for a lot of collectors and for a lot of other artists too, who like, you know, spoke out and said like, this is just, you know, really special and revolutionary. But then um, uh, like, outside of our blocks like there's so much authenticity you look there's there's obviously a gold rush that comes with the new technology and of the people that participate during the middle of that gold rush some of them are purely authentically doing what they've always done it just happens to finally have a, a spot in in the in the limelight and then a lot of people are really just taking advantage of the gold rush and um that's okay i think there's room for everybody here uh, but as that gold rush has subsided, you really do see stand out like people and projects and artists and creators. And, you know, I just as things have calmed down, because, gosh, in the in the crazy days of our blocks, I, I I lived under a rock. I live under a rock still. But like back then, it was just I mean, I, you know, I literally leave, lived and breathed our blocks 18 hours a day, discord, whatever. Um, you know, I've gotten to know people like Sam Spratt and um patrick edmonton and uh you know even got to spend a little bit of times with Excel and what lady cactoid is doing with through lacma and kind of dive into that a little bit more and um gosh it is incredible what people are doing within this ecosystem right now and uh it's also incredible that there's still there is still interest and appetite within the ecosystem for uh, a lot of the activity that's there, it's within a much smaller group of people and like the total sales numbers for these projects are much lower. They're actually much more reasonable too. Uh, you know, it's just like, what are we comparing it to? And so, you know, when I, um, when I want to boil this down into like expressing my bullishness, like what I'm so excited about in this space, it's, you know, it's, and I've been wanting to tweet this for such a long time. I just don't have the guts because I, I then don't respond to the tweet responses. And then I feel like a jerk, but like just what is your metric of success? Like what is your metric to being successful within this ecosystem? And if it's money, that's a hundred percent okay. Like there is nothing wrong with that. Is it meeting new people? That's there's a lot of that happening. Is it feeling a safe place to release artwork? Is it feeling a streamlined way to release artwork? Is it feeling safe about making purchasing decisions without being inside of a room where someone's trying to sell you something? Is it that you're a nerd and like you got to like release something even if nobody got to use it or you never intended it? Ultimately, I think that 90% of the metrics of success for people to participate in this ecosystem outside of purely making money, which there's nothing wrong with, are probably being met. And they're probably being like, they're energizing hundreds of people, thousands of people into like what this technology is. And um, I, I just, I, I don't see the value proposition changing from when we started this, you know, for, since the CryptoPunks came out, 
I don't see the global instantaneous decentralized availability of content, creative art, PFP, whatever you want to call it, like in any way, shape or form ever going away and us waking up one morning. Like I say this pretty often, but like, we're not just going to wake up as a civilization and be like, that was cool. But let's just go back to like attaching shit to emails. Like, I just don't see a world where we just kind of like, yeah, that was interesting. But like, let's just like move on from that. It just feels so relevant to me and so uh, real. And um, I think, you know, where where uh, my, you know, in I used to feel the weight of, you know, my own artistic career on my shoulders. And then I felt the weight of art blocks as a platform, which includes every artist and every collector, and also every person that works at the company, which is just like a beautiful group of people. And then I felt like kind of the weight of the generative art space, because it just became such a almost homogenized space. And like, it got so intense. And, and, and at this point, you know, I think if I, if I, if I ever don't come across as being as happy-go-lucky is that I'm feeling the weight of the entire NFT ecosystem on my shoulders. And it's not to say that I, and there's many other shoulders that feel it as well, but like, because I feel that there's uh, an opportunity for us to mess this up. And a lot of that is based on what I see on Twitter, which I try not to like doom scroll, but like, look, it's so bad out there in some cases. And what the problem is that the good stuff isn't surfacing as often as it should. And, um, and I think it's important for us to like really take time to like acknowledge that, that, you know, people get into their own ruts. I go into my own ruts all the time. There's mental health issues like rampant within this ecosystem. There's like shaming and, um, uh, you know, crazy gambling and whatever. And uh, sometimes the best stuff doesn't shine through. And I think it's really important for us to go out of our way to highlight the best parts of this, whether it's the artists, the creators, the the, the people that work at the companies, the collectors, um, and then eventually like the technology can shine through on its own without having to just be like NFTs, 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 like the technology just becomes the undercurrent that that brings us all um, brings us all to the surface. But yeah, you know, I'm, I'm I could not be happier. And I, I just uh, I, I spent a lot of my time sifting through some stuff that is based on people's hesitations and concerns for the ecosystem that I think shouldn't necessarily be there. But if they're not addressed, we might lose them. And the worst thing that could happen right now is losing artists and creators and their confidence. The royalty debate has already kind of created a really awkward situation for artists in general. Uh, losing collectors, not just because they're not making money, but because they feel this like weird vibe and tension and losing collectors over the concept of royalties. Like it's just, a, it's a very weird time. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people say we've kind of hit the bottom and that would be great. I, I'm not convinced, but I think that would be great if, if, if we had, because uh, I, I just don't want to keep losing people. I just, I, you know, we spent so much time and worked so hard to inspire people to be part of this ecosystem. And, and the idea that we would lose some of them, especially at a time like this is like really demoralizing. And um, so that's what I'm fighting for, at least. Well, if you define success as the positive impact upon people, I would have to say that you, Eric, are, are at the top of winning. I mean, I will genuinely, I know we're coming up on time. So I'll, I'll be brief because I have a tendency to ramble, but like the, the impact you've had on the space and the amount of like people you've touched and influences is really admirable. So I just want to say, I'll leave you with two very quick anecdotes that I, that I hope will make you feel hopeful and everybody who's listening as well. Um, you know, I, I, I came in for the money. I stayed because I love the art and I love the community. I will admit it. And I haven't looked back. I mean, we've been doing this for a year now. I can't believe it's been a year doing the collector's corner thing. And I just absolutely love it. Amazing. And I came from communities who during the bear market, it was all gloom and doom. And they were like, hey, can you come hop on a spaces and talk about positive stuff? I'm like, uh, yeah, there's tons of positive stuff. What are you talking about? Like in our art side, it feels like it's all been positive. And the last thing I'll say is I've talked to so many people, many in Grailers DAO, who Jared and I are active in, who have said, hey, you know, we found like we found, we've found our people. We found our tribe. Like we found yeah. our community here in the Web3 art world. And I think a lot of people feel that way. And to me, that is a big measure of success. And I just, I really believe in the long term that that is just going to keep permeating and more and more people are going to feel that way. So I, I too am long-term bullish. And I think, you know, echoing Jared's thoughts, you've done a fantastic job in, in shepherding us to this point. Uh, and, you know, we, we know that we feel very confident in your ability and we'll be helping along too, to, to get us to the the next level and, and continue to grow the space. I really appreciate that. Guys. I do. I appreciate that so much. I, I shared recently on a, in a conversation 
uh, somebody when on the royalty debate, people somebody reached out and was like, "Well, you made all this money. Like, what's your problem?" And my response was like, "If it wasn't for the art and the artists and the people that have quit their jobs to pursue art full time, or the collectors that discovered art as a result of this, that would have just bounced off this art thing, or people that have feel inspired and 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 like heard, I wouldn't I wouldn't trade my old life for the amount of money that." it generated like you have to think that like there's actually a cost from a mental health perspective to like your active participation in this ecosystem and it's taxing it is so hard it is so heavy travel all those things and if you rewind three years it's like yes of course i would want art blocks to, to exist but if the only reward for art blocks existence was financial i would very much take my life back and be able to just kind of like i don't i lived a, a, a very happy like you know upper middle class life and i've never really kind of been driven by money and so really it's people people other people finding joy out of this whether you're an artist a collector um people on my team that's literally the only thing that like differentiates between um you know like really that's what keeps me going that's what gets me out of bed and i'm just i'm really excited that people uh recognize that and uh i hope people understand that's like that's what drives me and so when people have a a, a positive things to say like I get really excited and obviously when someone has like you know pretty strong criticism which I welcome but often ungrounded and you know zealous um it can actually have a pretty demoralizing effect um and I think maybe that's why lately I feel this like extra weight because and people just they have they have so much to say and a lot of it just feels kind of out of left field but um, you're doing I really it appreciate job. it I don't know of anybody else in this space who's doing as good of a job. I know there's a lot of people and there's a lot of people doing good stuff, but as a advocate for generative art and supporting the community, anybody who's takes a moment to stop talking, stop posting on Twitter and actually sit and observe you're, you're one of the, the, uh, the biggest advocates for the space. I, I, I jokingly tell people, I don't know what he's on, but I want some because you, you <laughs> approach it with so much energy and enthusiasm and passion you can tell that you're 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 not monetarily motivated that this is something that's yeah, viscerally you know resonating with you and and, and i say that not to fluff you up but you I know i think that. especially you commented on in, in this period where negativity may be more prevalent you know hearing a a positive thing and, and being able to share that sentiment uh every once in a while is is a good thing and the other thing is a long way. This, i too have uh been in the porcelain and ceramic tile design industry so oh my we, god we gotta we talk to sit about down that and share war stories uh um, <laughs> oh my god that. <laughs> that's amazing guys i would love that sometimes that'd be great awesome well let's let's get you out of here we're over time thank you so much for being so generous as you are in all ways but certainly with your time with us today we really really appreciate you man uh love to have you back anytime and uh let us know how we can help Thank you all so much for having me, man. I could not be more grateful. Thank you. Y'all are so kind. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, for everybody listening, the fantastic Eric Snowfro. Um, I forgot to ask you. We'll get save it next time. I didn't ask why you, you got the name Snowfro. I think it has to do with the snow cones, but we'll save it. We'll save it for next time. We'll next time. Let's do this again to. for sure. That'd be great. Absolutely. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into Collector's Corner. We really appreciate you taking the time to listen. If you like this episode and want to help us out, please subscribe and leave us a review on your podcasting platform of choice like Apple Podcasts and Spotify and follow us on YouTube. Please also follow us on Twitter for announcements as we expand to other social and content platforms. Our Twitter handle is at collectors underscore XYZ. We'd also love to hear any feedback you have. So please comment or reach out. We're always striving to be more useful and get better so we can help you in your collecting journey. The Collector's Corner team and their guests are not registered investment advisors. All views expressed on this podcast are personal opinions and are not specific inducements to make particular investments or investment strategies and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. This show is solely for informational and entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, please consult a professional.